So in my previous video, Fear Much More, we were talking about the Rephaim sons of the Nephilim and their relationship to Gienna. That existence where both the body and soul are apollomai, wholly loosened away as completely separated as a hair from the head. Not the soul separated from the body, but the body and soul separated and become unclean spirits who are presently afflicting and oppressing on the earth land who in fact try to exist through us because their body and soul has been wholly loosened away where they seek rest in us so they can live through our bodies and our souls. And in this video, I would like to share with you some of my personal experiences with these spirits as they have oppressed and molested me. Where we read in verses such as Luke chapter 6 verse 18 that he was healing them from their sicknesses and those being innerly molested from unclean spirits. And this oppression and molestation is a result of them trying to make our bodies their dwelling, our watery bodies. And for us it doesn't work out too well. And if the truth be told I don't think it works out for them very well either. But as we will see as we move through this study, our bodies work out much better for them than waterless places. And for us, what it does in fact is create a host of both physical and mental disorders from A to Z. And if you go through this list, I can guarantee you that you can pick out some of these that pertain to yourself or other people that you know which in fact can be overcome, but not until we grow in the on knowledge of the Christ and even become aware of such thing. So we can learn how to slip into the full armor, the all armament, which for me has personally taken a lifetime. And my oppression and molestation began at a very young age. And these spirits take advantage of children because they know that they are not wearing the full armor. And now that I look back, I am aware of my oppression as far back as about eight years old. But I'm sure these spirits were about me at a much younger age. I just don't remember. And at the time, I was living in the Fox Valley Great Lakes area, of which water plays a significant role among these spirits. So to give a little background, I was living with my younger sister and my mother, who was divorced from my father. And the very house I grew up in was right here on Carver Lane. And about two blocks away was Little Lake Budemore. And the phrase Budemore means hill of the dead. And it's interesting that from Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 10 that these beings were known by some as Emim, Anakim, verse 11, Raphaim, of which the Old Testament names many more tribes of these. And as Raphaim, they were well known and are often mentioned. But sadly, many are unaware of what these are, and their proper names have been mistranslated as being the deceased or dead. For example, in Job 26.5, in the King James, it reads dead, which the Hebrew is rafa. So dead things are formed from under the water and the inhabitants thereof. Here's the NIV. The dead are in deep anguish, those beneath the waters and all that live in them. Let me clarify, this is not referring to the dead souls of human who are in Sheol or Hades, but it speaks of the Raphaim, where the dead here is from the Hebrew Rapha, referring to these anthropomorphic beings, where here the very first occurrence is to do with water. And again, as a young child, I would go to bed, and then all of a sudden in the middle of the night or in the morning, I would wake up with a panicky feeling like I cannot describe. It was a presence about me that gave me extreme anxiety. And I remember very clearly, I would try to call out to my mom and I could not speak. I could not raise my voice. It was like I was paralyzed in my vocal cords. Or rather, I simply couldn't get my breath out to raise my voice, my wind, my spirit wind. And this was while I was awake. And the second story to this house was a split level in itself. The upstairs master bedroom had a short flight of stairs going up to it. And the door to my bedroom was at the bottom of this short flight of stairs that went up to my mom's room. And when I would wake up feeling this way, I would sit up in bed and I would try to call out for her. But I couldn't raise my voice. Where later in my adulthood, I would also have the same paralysis, but in my dreams. But as a young child, when this would occur, I also would get the sensation that my hands felt like two balloons, literally. 
And if you're familiar with the band Pink Floyd, they released a song in 1979, and I was born in 66, which is titled Comfortably Numb. And it wasn't until I was in high school in the mid-80s that I even heard this song. And when I heard it, and I heard this line that states, When I was a child, I had a fever. My hands felt just like two balloons. I was like, whoa, me too. And to be honest, it wasn't until several years ago that I even became aware of what we are discussing in this video and my previous video, Fear Much More as to the origin of these spirits. But for me, this sensation that had actually occurred multiple times did not involve a fever, but rather anxiety and panic along with voice paralysis. And you might be asking yourself, well, why balloons? Maybe because these were giants and this is a metaphysical effect of them trying to come into a living organism, an environment being that of our bodies, our blood, our soul of which the human soul is in the blood, Leviticus 17.11, where often it is translated life, but this is the Hebrew word nefesh, soul, in contrast to a cold, lifeless body of water, such as Little Lake Butamore, or any body of water. No, they want to inhabit a human, living, fleshy, watery body, of which a human body would be their first choice to find comfort, but the second would be animals, such as swine, but the spirits beside called him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may come into them. Where most of us are familiar with what happened subsequently, where they hastened down the slope into the sea. Where in Mark and Luke's account, we read of the pigs suffocating in the sea. Where the context of suffocating is the pigs in the sea. But I believe we have a different context in Matthew's account. And many think that in this verse here of Matthew 8:32, that the swine deadened away or died with the additional mention of the water. But I don't believe this is what the context is. Here the word translated deadening away is from the Greek word apothenesco, not nekros or nekru. And apothenesco is from the preposition apo, which is away from, that of being away from the surface of a thing. And unlike necros, thanesco is a metaphysical deadening away in relationship to separations. So the point being is that when these spirits were cast into the swine and the swine hastened down the slope into the sea, they, the demonizing spirits, deadened away in the waters where the pigs suffocated in the sea. The pigs didn't metaphysically deaden away. And if the they who deadened away was speaking of the swine, then the verb nek kru would have been used. But here it is the metaphysical epothnesko, deadening away, meaning that these demon spirits deadened away from the host, which was the human and the soul of that human, in relationship to a metaphysical separation. That deadening away is seen as a metaphysical spiritual separation is seen in the statement Paul makes, that he daily deadened away, 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Yet in another example, we read, For you deadened away, and your life has been secreted together with Christ, Colossians 3, 3. All referring to metaphysical separations in relationship to our souls. The one having found his soul will wholly loosen it away, which would be through the process of deadening away. And the one wholly loosening away his soul for my sake will find it. And because these beings are soulless and bodiless, and they seek to identify through our soul, well, when they come out of our bodies, they deaden away to our souls. So their next choice would be to identify with the soul of the animal, which resulted in the swine being demonized, and then the swine ran into the sea. And when the swine suffocated and perished, then the spirits were left without a body. And they don't seek rest in waterless places, they seek rest in watery places, of which the lifeless, soulless sea is something they do not desire. And ask yourself, why do you think Jesus was walking around on the water? Well, he wasn't doing it just for the fun of it, it was a parable. What it was, was a picture of the subordination of his enemies under his feet. Again, those of Job 26.5. Those death slackened who whirl forth under the waters and those dwelling in them, of which these demons who seek rest in watery places are his enemies. 
Remember from my previous video, the context of Luke 19, 27. Whereas these my enemies, those not wanting that I reign over them, lead here and slaughter down them in front of me. For it is binding for him to reign until he set all of the enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15, 25. And when Jesus was in the ship with his learning ones, he was resting. He was just chilling out while the learning ones were freaking out. But in verse 39, we read that Jesus warned the wind and said to the sea, hush up. Or as we would say here, shut up. And then his learning ones are fearing, saying, since also the wind and the sea are below hearing to him. And both wind and water are figures of speech for spirit. And just as he told the sea to hush up, we read in Mark chapter 1, verse 34, he drove out many demons, and not did he let the demons speak, since they had perceived him. So the point being is that we see many parallels between the spirits and water. Life under the sea is better than anything they got up there. And there you have some Walt Disney propaganda. Why do you think they are propagating that under the sea is better than up on the land? Well, because these are out of their father Diabolos. And the desires of their father, according to John 8, 44, is that he is a human slayer from the origin. And like their father, they are full of all manner of wickedness, falsification, and deception. And if they can't come up to our plane of existence, they want to bring you down to their plane of existence. And I don't know the validity of this, but there is a book titled The Witch Doctor and the Man, City Under the Sea. And if you search YouTube, you'll find some videos regarding this. But back to my experiences with these Rafaim spirits, where of course I was living inland, but surrounded by the Great Lakes. And during this same time period, I remember very clearly my mom waking up at night she was calling out for me to come upstairs into her room. And I jumped into the bed with her and she was like, listen, listen, somebody's in the house. And all of a sudden we heard this deep guttural moan. And my sister, who was probably like four years old at this time, was still sleeping. And my mom said to go get her. And I'm like, heck no, I'm not going down there. Somebody's in the house. So I called out to her. I said, Amy, Amy, come up here. So she woke up and then she came upstairs and then we climbed in bed with mom waiting to see if we could hear it again, but we never heard the voice again. And the next day we were talking about it and we thought, well, maybe it was Mrs. West who lived next door. She was an elderly lady and maybe she was having pain. I remember her also thinking maybe it was a homeless person who was outside or had come in the house seeking help. And I thought, well, why didn't they stay? Why didn't they keep crying out for help then? But anyway, it didn't take long before we just brushed it aside. But then two weeks later, in broad daylight in the morning, my sister and I were in the kitchen eating our cereal. And out of nowhere, we heard this guttural moan right where we were sitting. I mean, I'll try to duplicate it. It was, just, it was like this. Oh. And my sister looked at me and I looked at her and we had chills going down our spine and our eyes were bugged wide open. And immediately I was like, that's the same voice that I heard with mom. Like I said, I was like eight years old and my sister was four years old. So my mom had heard it and she woke me up and I heard it together with her. So she heard it twice. And then two weeks later, my sister and I were together and I heard it with my sister as if it was right there next to us having breakfast with us in the kitchen. So I also got the privilege of hearing it twice. Once together in the witness of my mom and once together in the witness of my sister. And it was at this time when I remember that my mom was getting involved in transcendental meditation. She was into the whole hippie era. She had weird occult books on the bookshelf. Her boyfriend was into yoga. And yet another boyfriend she had, who I remember his name, it was David Ray. And he was a magician who used a crystal ball in his act. And she was trying to get my sister and I into this transcendental meditation also. Where I remember very clearly, she took us to this guy's house. He did a little ritual back in his bedroom and he gave us a word. 
and we were to meditate each day and repeat this word over and over for at least 20 minutes, we were told. So yeah, I did it for maybe a week, but you know, I was young. I was like, what the heck is this all about? So it was really just a short phase thing for me. And I don't know how long my mom continued into it. But bottom line, what we were doing was inviting unclean spirits into our house, into our space and into our presence. And how many, I don't know if it was one or many, but I will tell you this, that they have followed me around all my life, wherever I go, and always seeming to afflict me at night. And later in high school, I had moved to live with my father and my stepmother here in Georgia. And my stepmother said that she would wake up at night and hear me pounding and banging on the headboard of my bed. She said she tried to come in there and try to wake me up. And she said I gripped her hand so strong that she thought I was going to break her wrists. It was as if I had a superhuman strength. And this happened on multiple occasions and she told me about it and I kind of laughed at her. I said, no, I, I, I would have remembered that. And why didn't I wake up? And all through my 20s up into my mid 30s, I often had night terrors. I would wake up in utter pain as if something had thrown me out of bed across the room. I would wake up on the other side of the room and on other occasions, I would wake up and not know where I was. I would be standing up and I was like, where am I? Where am I? And to be honest, these attacks were at a time when I was even going to church. I was singing on the praise team. I was involved in the ministry. I was reading my Bible, but at the same time oppressed by demonic spirits. And in the mid 90s, when I was going through severe physical challenges with diabetes, blindness and kidney failure, I was doing a lot of praying because of these many afflictions that were coming upon me. And one night I remember as I was falling deep into sleep, I saw a demon coming right at my head. It's hard to describe. It's as if it was a face, but it was a wind. It was very evil looking and it was flying really fast right at my face. And then as if it went through my head, and quite frankly, it scared the hell out of me. And I jumped up. I woke up and I was like, in the name of Jesus. And I was like, I saw you. I saw you. And it was at this very moment I realized that this was the thing causing my night terrors. And it was this evening that I consciously was given the ability to see it. And it was from this moment that my extreme severe night terrors had ceased. And to me, it was as if the Lord had called off this demon from me in its ability to terrorize me in my sleep. And in his last attempt to take a shot at me, the Lord allowed me to see it, to visualize it in a confirmation that it was indeed spiritual. But at this time in my life, this was not going to be the end of this oppression from these spirits, which again was a time when I was seeking God in the organized church. I was seeking God the only way I knew how at this time, but seeking God by going to a church is not the answer. Because quite frankly, many demons and wolves in sheep's clothing hang out in the organized 501c3 church. And it wasn't until many years later that I realized doctrinally everything I had learned in these organizations were falsifications, teachings through demons, 1 Timothy 4.1. It wasn't until I removed myself from them and started seeking God alone that I began to understand the Word of God. And this has been a long journey for me through many, many hardships and much chastening. Because even after leaving organized religion, I would continually seek men. I would buy books, which tens of thousands of them are released yearly. I would seek the expositions and commentaries of men rather than digging deep into God's writ, trusting the spirit of truth. And for me, it took such a long time, and it wasn't until three or four years ago that I realized that I've been faithing in what men say in men's words, not in what God says in his word. And honestly, publishers are in it to make money. They are businesses, and what they are doing is peddling the word of truth. And in my lack of trusting and seeking God alone, I was compromised. I was not wearing the full armor. I had not the shield of faith. Because now that I look back, I see that my faith was imagined. It was feigned. It was based on falsifications, speculations, and suppositions. 
And in my floundering around and my being blown around by every wind of doctrine, I was simply moving from one theology to another, which were all mere fleshly endeavors, ignoring God's righteous judgment in relationship to his safeguarding, where most today seem to be only concerned about their blessings and what they can get. So as a carnal Christian, loving the things of this cosmos were misleading me to through judge through judge what is really going on in this cosmos and how we are to withstand by wearing the armor. Not imagely or imagined, but in truth. And it was about four years ago when the Spirit of God came upon me powerfully and said, it's time to turn around. Because at the time I was operating a recording studio and a large portion of my clients were secular rap and hip-hop artists, of which I was surrounding myself with their filth. And also at this time, I was myself in a progressive heavy metal band, ironically named Void of Reason. And I shut down the recording studio business. I quit the band. I went through my house. I got rid of every book, every CD, as well as any and all objects that I had believed were bearing the taint of the darkness. Being in the band, I must have had 25 t-shirts that are in the style of what is called affliction wear. They look really cool, but they're themed with death, skulls, crosses. So I got rid of every last one of them. I didn't even give them to goodwill. I just threw them in the trash. And as time progressed, I began studying the Word of God for myself in a more serious manner. And I ended up having to get rid of a lot of books, so-called Christian books, that I was heeding doctrines from that I was beginning to discover were falsifications. Doctrines of demons. And about the same time when I was cleaning house, I started seeing an increase in attacks. And just like when I had a breakthrough with the demon giving me night terrors, I was having another breakthrough. And it's obvious to me now that when you start having a breakthrough, they don't like it. They get angry. And I'd received a very strange phone call. And I don't have many friends, so people aren't calling me every day. But somebody had called me and they started mocking me on the phone, repeating everything I said. And I was still a bit carnal, and I started cussing the guy out. And he started cussing me out. It was just really a weird thing. And then for the next few days, somebody kept calling my wife's cell phone. She'd pick it up, and nobody would be there. So I began answering it. Who is this? And they wouldn't answer me. So I'd hang up the phone, and then the phone would ring again. I was like, hello, and nobody would say anything. And this happened over again and again. And I knew this was demonic, but I actually found some humor in it because I was thinking to myself, well, is this all you have now? I mean, you're going to try causing somebody to call me and antagonize me through the phone. And even more incidences where I would be studying the Word of God, heeding 2 Timothy 2.15, And as I was sitting at my desk, I kept hearing breathing and panting noises. And I have two dogs that sometimes are in here with me. So I looked around. I thought it was one of my dogs, but my dogs were not in the room and the door was shut. And I immediately knew that this was spiritual. And honestly, I could share many other experiences. But the point being is that when I finally discovered the truth and how to truly put on the full armor... All such things have ceased. I withstood Diabolos and his methods, and he did flee. James 4, 7. However, it was a process, a very long process for me. So what we see is that these spirits, for some of us, they afflict us by trying to find rest in our bodies. And if not our bodies, their next choice would be an animal. And seeing now that those days, as in the days of Noah, are rapidly approaching, let's ask ourselves, well, what about clones? Manipulated life forms outside of God's divine creation, which is nothing new under the sun, because these fallen angels and these Raphaim were doing such long ago. What do you think that the Darnell is in Matthew 13, 25? It is something that has been sown in the midst of the grain, But Darnell is poisonous. These fallen ones are experts at the physics of genetics. Who do you think men like Richard Seed are learning this technology from? Consider this website called CloneAid. You can download a PDF file to get information from them. And when you open it, you see at the top here, it says Ra'el. What is the Ra? 
Well, I believe it's from the Hebrew word Rafa, because El is God. And with a lowercase e, Elohim describes the sons of God, the fallen Elohim, creating cloned beings that their lost children can inhabit. The context of Psalms 82, namely verse 6, speaks of Elohim, or gods, as fallen angels. And their children are the Rapha, the mighty Gabor of old, whose parents, in fact, are fallen gods, these little g gods. And again, what I think is occurring is that these unclean spirits would much rather inhabit a clone rather than an actual human being. Because the soul of a clone is not going to be the same as a soul of a human being, of which soul becomes into the human being through the means of which the divine creator brings it forth into existence, not in the same manner as these fallen Elohim do. And it would seem that these Raphaim could express themselves through a clone much easier than through a human being. Because when they try to inhabit a non-cloned human being, they are having to tug against that human spirit and that human soul. Of which soul, of course, is the mind, the will, and the emotions of that human. And I believe that part of this cloning is the parable of the seed that gets sown in the field, which is the cosmos. Which is allowed to grow up together with the grain where it will be bundled at the conclusion and then down burned in that blast furnace that unextinguishable fire of Guiana where previously the judgment was water and for them we our bodies are living water that can give them rest in order to feel and maintain some kind of semblance of an identity which they lost. And these are in fact the context of the unclean spirit in Luke chapter 11 verses 24 through 26. And before we consider these verses, understand that even the unjust among humanity, of which all will awaken in resurrection, will awaken swept clean of their demons and adorned meaning in sickness and disease. But as for their demons, they will return to them in the resurrection, where they had previously lost their dwelling in that human being. Because we read, when as it were the unclean spirit comes out from the human, he, the spirit, comes through waterless places seeking up repose. Repose that is directed upward, which Hellenic word can also be translated again repose. And when the human dies and the dwelling site dries up and turns back into dust, the spirit, the unclean spirit, goes through waterless places, seeking up repose again. And not finding it, he says, I will return into my dwelling site where I came out. Now here is the resurrection of the human, of which the spirit is going to return to. That is in accord with the resurrection portion of John 5:29. And having come, he, the spirit, finds it having been swept and adorned. Meaning swept of its demons and adorned as being restored back to its health. Again, both among the just and the unjust alike. And what is the expectation or hope of most in the resurrection? Well, for the majority, they believe that when you die, you go directly to heaven or you go directly to hell forgetting that there is a judgment in the day of the eon, where some go into life and will be down established over many to do such things as curing works and to give over measure of grain in term, but also a day of wrath, where many will be given up to those tormentors of Matthew 18.34 until they should have paid all that is indebted. And just as these spirits at present are inflicting and oppressing with impunity, they will be doing so in the judgment. And esoterically and parabolically, Jesus is saying that for you who are entertaining these spirits, it's going to be worse. It's going to be sevenfold. Then he, the spirit, goes and beside takes, yea, with himself, seven ulterior spirits, more evil than he himself. And as having come, they down dwell there, and the last state of that human becomes worse than the foremost ones. And now you can imagine why a more finished solution for these would be if a milling stone were laid around Ye about his neck and he were to be flung into the sea. And that the one returns with seven ulterior spirits is a demonstration of pure pressure because these will be seeking payback. 
Think of the many who sell their souls for riches due to their greed and their hunger for power and control. And of course, this is not limited to the entertainment industry, but happening all through our society, among secret societies, secret organizations, among people in positions of authority, running our governments, etc., of which many are consciously having relationships with familiar spirits, literally selling their souls by signing their names in blood and doing ritual sacrifice to their gods, which is nothing new under the sun. The same gods they worship of old are the same gods they worship today, which gods are promising them freedom. 2 Peter 2.19 And when these who worship these false gods awaken in resurrection, they're going to find out that they are going to be owing a debt for the selling of their souls. And these spirits will want to collect on the souls that these had sold to them. And how do people sell their souls? Well, they become familiar with these spirits. These spirits become their so-called friends. Like the song Monster by the rap artist Eminem states, where these monsters are in fact the spirits of Refaim, who speak to them in their heads, giving them all kinds of ideas as they are channeling these demons, who bring them fortune and fame. They say to the human, let us live through you and you sell your soul to us. But what people don't realize is that these beings are soulless in nature. They have no conscience. They have no ability to reason. And they are narcissistic liars. Which is demonstrated in the parable of the ten minas. Where in verse 24 of Luke 19, the mina is lifted away from this ulterior one, which in fact are demon seed. And because he did nothing with the mina, it is lifted from him and said to be given to the one with ten minas. But these narcissistic beings say to him, the Lord, But Lord, he already has ten minas. And then you see what happens to this one as being slaughtered down. And this confrontation with these with the minas is after the great affliction, of which the context of Matthew chapter 10 verse 42 applies. That is as an antithesis to this ulterior one, who did no such thing as this verse reads, stating, and whosoever gives to one of these small ones shall not wholly loosen away his reward. Which here those who do such are my least brothers of Matthew 25 40, which these ulterior ones did not do. How much soul does it take to give somebody one cup of cool water to drink in the time of great affliction? And when the Lord will talk to these out of his left side, he will say, Go away from me, you having been cursed into the Aeonian fire, that having been prepared for Diabolos and his angels. For I hungered, and you did not give me to eat. I thirsted, and you did not give me to drink. I was guestening, and you did not lead me together with you. I was weak and in jail, meaning the judgment. You did not heed to me. The same enemies that do not want the Lord to reign over them, because they will not subordinate. And these who are the soulless ones who cannot even give one cool cup of water to drink to somebody who is thirsty, will be down burned as the chaff. In the same context of those Jesus is calling wood, the children of the tree being of the knowledge of good and evil, the serpent tree. In Luke chapter 23, verses 28 through 31, Jesus is addressing the daughters of Jerusalem, saying, Do not sob for me, whereas sob for yourselves and for your children. <laughs> well, what children? Children of mingled seed. Enoch chapter 39, verses 1 and 2. Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. Perceive days come in which they will talk, Blissful are the barren ones, and the body cavities which did not let become, and the nipples which did not nourish. Did not let become and did not nourish what? Serpent seed. More children from the fallen angels of the next incursion with human women, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, where again they ate, they drank, they married, they gave in marriage until the day when Noah came into the ark and the down flood came and lifted them all away. Likewise, according so as it came to be in the days of Lot, we see the same thing. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, and they planted, they dwell build. The they being the fallen, not humans, but fallen angels and their offspring, of which this time the heavens are reserved by fire, not water. 
Verse 31, if they do this with the hydrous wood, the wet or green wood, the new, what will then become with the old dried up wood? Well, what happens to fresh newly cut wood when you throw it into the fire? Well, it takes longer to consume. And what happens to dried up wood when you throw it in the fire? It's consumed very quickly. So the wood here is a figure of speech for these mixed beings from that tree being of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. In relationship to Guiana derived from the gorge of the sons of Hinnom as shown by Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 31 and verse 32. These are those of 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 12 called inconsidering enlivened or animals having been made to become as natural beings but to come into captivation and corruption wherein they are unknowing, they blaspheme, so they also will be corrupted in their corruption. What this is saying is that they unknowingly are blaspheming, which are the same of Jude chapter 1 verse 10, and their corruption will be finished in Guiana, which is also in relationship to Topheth, where in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 33 we read where it is prepared which he has deepened, he has widened its rolling places, a fire and tree being in quantity are there. The breath of Yahweh as a world brook of sulfur is consuming in it, which the word Guiana is from the valley of Hinnom, which bordered the valley of Rephaim. Wood kids, goats, kids. And if you think I'm kidding, no pun intended, Google the music group called Wood Kid and see what they're all about. And when you look at some of the titles of this band's songs, you see that one of them is called Iron, of which the fallen make up the iron in the mingled iron and clay that we read about in Daniel chapter 2, of which clay speaks of the human body. Another song is titled The Golden Age, which is in relationship to the hermeneutic order of the Golden Dawn. More song titles are Ghost Lights, which lyrics read, waking up in a world surrounded by flames, where everything I like is about to fade. How could you be the one if you're not the same, if in the hands of gods you have lost your way? And the only logical conclusion is that green wood is the new incursion. The old dried up wood were these of Enoch, whose bodies and souls were wholly loosened away from their spirits. And the punishment of this Ionian fire and this Guiana of fire prepared for Diabolos, his angels, and two classes of kids carries into the next eon of a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness down dwells and where the offspring of Nephilim of old became evil spirits upon the earth, afflicting and oppressing, etc., the word of God is very clear that things will be different in the impending eon. Those who will be wholly separated, body and soul, according to Matthew chapter 10 verse 28, who are in Guiana, among the hydrous wood, represented in the neuter gender Erephion, or goats, kids, who go into that Eonian punishment of Matthew 25 46, will not roam and afflict in the earth in the new heavens and new earth. For here am I, the creator of a new heavens and a new earth land, and not will be remembered all the origin beings, and they will not ascend any more onto the heart. And these origin beings are the same that Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And regarding Eonian fire, well, Eonian is simply an adjective, which modifies a noun, which would be an eon, of which Eonian fire speaks of an impending eon for those who have no justice. This is their judgment, resulting in transgressions and corruption that carried through from a past eon into the present eon, where Genesis 1-1 looks backwards into an origin of old, which became the chaos and discomposure of verse 2, and the altogether finishing of the eons, plural of Hebrews 9:26, is referring to a past eon that carried into the present eon, hence eons. The word diabolos is from dia, which is through, and bolo, cast. And according to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he is our judicial opponent in relationship to the Eonian judgment of this now present eon. And as diabolos, he will be casting many through the day of judgment, all the way up until the altogether finishing. 
Satan will not come into cold thinking at the end of the tribulation to be saved, but rather he will go into that prepared for him, the impending Eonian fire. There is nothing in the word of God to suggest otherwise. And even if there was ability of Satan to come into cold thinking and like wording into the truth, the consequence and penalty of his transgressions are not the same as that of human. Because he and his angels are Eonian beings, the human race are not. We have the expectation of Eonian life, but it's not yet manifest. And it seems to me that there are many today who debate what is the fate of Satan and his angels, where some express sympathy for the devil, which, friends, is dangerous. Because to have sympathy for Diabolos is to have sympathy for the one who can after schematize himself as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11.14 And his angels are error-rising spirits, and those of his seed are also falsifiers. Not our friends like the rapper Eminem so believes. I don't think we should be so concerned about what is their fate. We should be sympathizing for our brothers and sisters of the human race who are being errorized and demonized by them. And those who are actually heeding doctrines of demons and having sympathy towards the devil and his angels have not had a realization of the true corruption that is getting ready to be unleashed on this earth. The bloodbath that will incur under the headship of their king, the human slayer, in that day of slaughter, the slaughter of the sheep, not the slaughter down of the goats. So understand that the context of what people deem as being hell was not created for the human genome, the human soul, the anthropos creation of God, of which he is the safe guardian of all human, foremost of the faithing ones. But Gienna exists for corruption brought about by Diabolos, his angels, and those who corrupt with them. Understand that the judgment of human beings is going to be made a short work of, but the judgment of corruption is Eonian. So if you have loved ones who are stubborn and incompliant to the evangel in the well announcement of Jesus Christ at present, who are not fearing the Lord, as many are now even becoming apostate unwittingly, who will be wholly loosened away into the judgment, and somebody has told you that they're going to hell, well, think twice. Because the great sifting and winnowing in the last days is not hell, Gienna. But I can tell you this, it's going to be extremely severe, some more than others. However, all who maintain an uncorrupted human soul, every knee will bow. If they are in fact human and they give one cup of cool water to drink to somebody who is thirsty during that day of trouble, they will not wholly loosen away their reward. So I hope you can find some consolation in that fact, perceiving the mildness of God, but also perceive the sharpness of God, the cutting away, and be made to fear him in all reverence, for he is almighty God. So fear him now that you may not have to fear much more in that day. And I might add, if you are presently dealing with these unclean spirits, it's time for you to clean your house now, before the Eonian judgment. And we do this by being sober and watchful, knowing that our judicial opponent, the Diabolos, walks about as a growling lion seeking someone to down drink. So slip into the full armor, the all armament, seeking wisdom from God, that you may be wholly finished ones into the parousia of our Lord.